Hello and welcome to Movie Vault 666. My name is Chris, and this week we'll be looking at the film East LA Warriors. Now, what is it about the film A Time to Die that just keeps coming back to haunt me? This time, not only do we have the original producers from A Time to Die and Night of the Wilding, Joseph Murphy and Richard Pepin, we also have Addison Randall, who played the memorable role of Detective from Night of the Wilding. You see, this is a late 80s action film where, rather than focusing on real life problems from gangs, they instead focus on a parallel universe where the gangsters have decided to form a gladiatorial combat system rather than fighting over turf. So, let's sit back and see just how well that worked out. This is KFYI and I'm the Raver. And I'm apparently the best way the writers could think of bringing that information to you. Tonight, we're going to talk about a rumor that's running rampant on the streets of LA. Unless the affected party can get the money together to pay me off. A rumor that somebody has revived the old Roman gladiator games. Oh yeah, those are the ancient Roman games. I'd recognize them anywhere. It seems that every two years or so, the gangs in this city call a truce to go to these so-called games. But they never invite me for some reason. Well, are they real? Or just another L.A. street name? Give us a call. We want to know. Line one. You're on the air with The Raver. I think that Gladiator's great. Go get him, Gladiator! Yeah! So anyway, as you may have gathered, these are supposed to be the Roman games, for some reason resurrected as a gaudy wrestling event. Then the title flashes up, and judging by the sound effects, I guess it's so awful people are already trying to shoot at this film. So with the exposition out of the way, it's time to completely change tone, as we cut to what presumably the directors think Mexicans do all day when they're not tending their gardens. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure this is stereotyped enough. Better add a piñata. Beautiful. But then the party is interrupted by what appears to be some UFO footage. The drive-by shooting hits several people, and even worse, the piñata! No! The piñata was only one day from retirement! Every year, 100 piñatas are killed in drive-by shootings. A donation of just one pound can prevent this, whilst just 50 pence could save one from a brutal stick beating. Thank you. With many people dead, the police and a news reporter are quickly on the scene. The shock and pain of East LA's latest in a series of brutal drive-by killings is still very evident here at Willow Park, where a birthday party was being held for 13-year-old Juanito Santis. It is alleged that this terrible incident is some sort of gang-related reprisal shooting. But wait a minute, I thought the whole point of this film was that they were having gladiatorial games to kill each other. What's the point if they're still just shooting each other without repercussions? Or are they just saving more bullets to shoot at hated title screens? Police have confirmed six dead, all young Hispanics in their early to late teens, including young Juanito Santis. Only two of the dead were known to be gang members. With me now is Sergeant Carl Summers of the LAPD Crash Unit. I have with me the town drunk dressed in a cheap police officer's costume. Is there any truth to the rumor that there are some kind of gang games? Games where fights between gang members are fought to the death? Sergeant, is there any sign of the plot? Listen, I have nothing further to say at this time. No, that's what I thought. Here we're introduced to one of our main characters, Eddie Rodriguez, an LAPD officer who's questioning people at the party. This then leads us to our main character, Paolo. It takes a particularly inquisitive mind to become an LAPD officer, it seems. Who did this? I don't know. Damn it, Paolo. I'm... Oh, you've already gone. Oh. The horror of death has again struck in East L.A. This time, taking six young lives, who just wanted to have a good time and celebrate a friend's birthday. The name of Juanito Santis was once written on a birthday cake. Now it must be inscribed on a tombstone. Yes, it seems the real tragedy here is the extra work being dumped on engravers. Oh, the humanity. Line four, you're on the air with the raver. Yeah, I just heard about that kid that got killed in the drive-by tonight. Yeah, a real shame. Yeah, the news said something about some kind of gang games. You ever hear about anything like that? Yeah, two years ago. But these punks don't need any kind of games to kill each other. All they need is a gun. 
Good point, film. Why do you exist? The next scene of any relevance takes place at the hangout of one of the gangs, the Lobos, which is the gang that Paolo runs with. They're busy doing real gang stuff, like shaking hands and standing awkwardly when one of the members decides to bring up an order of business. Jose, Pedro, Carlos, Juanito, Leti, by Leticia. Por qué? For what? In case you weren't sure what por qua meant. We pay back tonight, man. As obviously illustrated by this picture of a man standing in an alleyway. Anyway, Hector's proposal is met with resistance from Paolo and from Miguel, the gang's leader, who prefer to save it for the games. The other gang members have nothing to say on the matter, as that would require writing more lines, and like that was going to happen. Anyway, a fight is averted when the gang begins chanting Lobos, but this is broken up when a car speeds into view. The car belongs to Eddie, who chases after Miguel. Damn it, Miguel, I'm getting too old for this shit! You're definitely too old for this shit. What, is he John McClane all of a sudden? Also, panpipe music? Does that really get your blood pumping for an exhilarating chase scene? Anyway, in the next scene, we see the leader of the gangs and the man who was able to get the gangs to organise death fights amongst themselves, oh. Cesare. And because this is an 80s action movie and there was a moment of grief for one of our characters, guess who was behind the death of Juanito? You must have been hit. Although it does turn out that Cesare was actually aiming to have someone else killed and his goons just missed. It would be easier to get this information though if Cesare didn't insist on mumbling half of his lines. Meanwhile, Miguel arrives home for a relaxing beer. Are you okay? Yeah. No, you're not. You will feel the way I tell you to feel. Where is the pride in knowing that your family has killed the most children or taught them to kill? Anyway, this is Miguel's girlfriend, and she wants to leave Miguel as she's completely against him being in a gang. I can't stay here with you anymore. Tired of being afraid. I'm tired of having to watch and be careful where I go, what I do, what I say. I'm tired of your stupid world and it's stupid killing. And I'm tired of listening to you try to act, but you don't hear me complain. Oh, oh, wait. I want to join the real world. Go ahead then. Go on, get out. <laughs> I'm sorry. And apparently that's just the kind of slap that really turns a woman on. Oh hey look, it's this film's biggest fan. So anyway, this scene doesn't really go anywhere, I'm not entirely sure why it's here. Oh yeah, right. Moving on, and it's time for Juanito's funeral. We get a very dull service, but then what the hell is this? Apparently people really need to go to this church, because people are just ascending immediately. Anyway, eventually it comes down to just Paolo and his mother, who apparently weren't good enough to ascend. Oh, and this guy, who just sort of walks in awkwardly. Eventually they leave, and we get to see a normal day for Paolo and his mother. Okay, how do I start this? Dear Agent, you are fired. Can you go to the store for me after work? Okay. Well, here's a lit. Why must you dress like that? You know the circus isn't in town till next weekend. To survive. Survive? What good did it do your brothers? What good did it do your father? So it quickly becomes apparent what Paolo's mother's role in the film is. To tell him to leave the gang because she thinks it's dangerous. But come on, what could possibly go wrong? You're on top of top and you're wearing low ball colors. You must be one stupid motherfucker. You know, this guy sounds like a good judge of character. Meanwhile, another character, Aurelio, played by Tony Bravo, who the trailer assures me is an international superstar, is slowly beginning his day. Oh, come on, what kind of film is this? They cut away before I got to see whether he locked his door or not. Anyway, he must be some kind of slasher killer, because he somehow immediately teleports to Paolo's location. Not that the film gives any indication of how far away that is, and fights off Paolo's assailants. 
Harold then arrives at work where he's a waiter covered in bruises and clearly not in any state to work. I don't miss my thing. I, uh, I ran into a slight problem on my way to work. You okay, Sean? Yeah, I'm fine. Sure. Yeah, Mr. Martin. Really, I'm fine. Anyway, I'm too drunk to make decisions. I'm sure you're fine. Paolo Amo. Sorry about your brother. Oh, so I guess Juanito was Paolo's brother then. You know, if you'd made a better stab at showing that, I might have given a shit movie. Anyway, having for some reason not been sent home, Paolo finishes his day at work, whereas Cesare pointed out to him and the audience rather ham-fistedly. He then goes and speaks to our radio from earlier. What do you want? To, to thank you for this morning. You're welcome. How do you find me? I thought by not linking this to any of the other sets, this would be untraceable. I want to learn to fight like you. Go away. Why? Because I say so. But, but I want to learn. I want to learn! I won't teach you! Go away! Let go! Let go, Don't worry about it, Paolo. If 80s movies have taught me anything, is that if a mentor says he won't train you, it's just a guarantee that he will eventually train you. Anyway, having seen his potential mentor stare at him awkwardly from the other side of the fence, Paolo returns home defeated. Paolo, what happened? Uh... I ran into several doors. Anyway, you can pretty much repeat the dialogue from before because nothing has changed between these two characters. We then see Paolo attempting to speak to Aurelio again. However, he's busy training on the beach. Now this shot is really impressive because it's not often you see a stick out acting a man. Anyway, because this film would be a lot shorter if Aurelio just took Paolo under his wing now, he rejects him and calls him a punk for as yet undefined reasons. And then the scene ends. Meanwhile, in a very brief scene, Eddie receives a phone call. Son of a bitch. Eddie then heads to a cafe, where it turns out the mysterious caller was Aurelio, and that the two of them knew each other, but they fell out of touch. I'm sorry about Loretta. She's a good guy. Ah, so she must have attended the church from earlier then. Anyway, Eddie attempts to get Aurelio to help him on his mission. Well, if we could just get the gangs to throw away the goddamn guns. Then we could just pick them up and shoot them. So having met with Eddie, Aurelio goes home, hugs a portrait and flashes back to a memory that I'm sure will have no further bearing on the plot. And in the other corner, Paolo's father! I mean a mysterious man who we don't know who he is. Anyway, Aurelio and the mysterious figure fight as the crowd... What is that? Sort of... Moo, I guess? Eventually the fight gets completely out of control and it ends with Aurelio's wife being shot and killed and the opponent dead as well. Get him a body bag! Yeah! Anyway, naturally the emotional turmoil within him is represented here by a peaceful slumber. Eventually Aurelio is awoken when Eddie arrives at the scene because why make one scene when you can make two identical ones? I remember the last time you and I sat at this table. We were both so hungover, I thought we were going to die. Which is typically what happens when you're hungover. Anyway, this time Aurelio agrees to help, and the scene ends back at Paolo's workplace, where Hector has served Cesare and received a large tip from him, causing either the worst acting or most genuine sarcasm from Hector. Viva Cesare! However, he doesn't take too kindly to the intrusion of his boss. That was very nice. I wish you would treat all the clients like you treat him. Get out of my face, man. It's not healthy. Really? Your face looks fine to me. I can suck a wobble. So with much incomprehensible mumbling, the scene ends and Paolo returns to Aurelio's home like a loyal dog. Why are you back? Because I got no place else to go. And this scene is so irrelevant, I'm not even going to bother showing clips from it. <laughs> then we go straight back to the restaurant where Paolo looks into Cesare's eyes. Because Aurelio told him to before cutting straight back to Paolo, Aurelio's house, where Aurelio grudgingly agrees to train Paolo. However, Aurelio promised that this would be gruelling, so let's see what kind of torture Paolo has put through for this training. Okay, step one, hold sparklers. Got it. Hey, Aurelio, it's many things. But what is most important? 
I don't know. What do you think, Conan? You crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and you hear the lamentation of your women. That is good. That is good. He also has to hold paint cans and other tedious workouts, and finally ending it by making dramatic silhouette poses. Make poses with me! So with Paolo training complete, he and Aurelio talk on the beach, because, you know, it's not completely asinine to shoot a scene on a beach when you don't have the sound equipment to prevent the waves from muffling every line of dialogue. What's wrong? So with Paolo and Aurelio working together, and Paolo's training complete, it looks as though we might actually get to see some fighting. That is, until Paolo's mother shows up at Aurelio's house. Somehow. Carmen, it's not what you think. This Manny kill your father! With this reveal, Paolo leaves, provoking a totally necessary slow motion scene, interjected with black and white clips from earlier in the film. So having lost his pupil, Aurelia goes to talk to Paolo's mother. What do you want? To talk. I have nothing to say to you. Well, I have something to say to you, and it concerns Paolo. What is it? May I come in? Um, you already are in, but okay. So Aurelio explains his reasons for wanting to help Paolo, but his mother still holds the fact that Aurelio killed her husband against him for some reason. You still blame me for child. You killed him. You lost the husband. And I lost my wife. It was a challenge. Chava chose the weapon. And he tried to kill me. I simply reacted. I simply reacted. By stabbing him 50 times and kicking him until he stopped screaming. Anyway, eventually the radio manages to convince Paolo's mother to let him train Paolo. Although, speaking of Paolo, where is he? No, Paolo, don't sit in that church, you'll end up ascending, and then who will save everyone? So Paolo, having had his training, returns to the Lobos, who are apparently still part of this film, and still hanging out at their headquarters in what appears to be an old abandoned Saved by the Bell set. Paolo picks a fight with the entire gang, although the sound quality is so bad and the rest of the gang are so busy engaging in rowdy gang behaviour, like polite applause, that I was unable to hear why. However, after he takes down the pointless extras of the gang, Paolo goes up against Hector and wins, but this provokes Hector to draw a knife on Paolo, who is saved by the timely arrival of a radio. This leads to a scene in which Hector waits till nightfall and gets drunk enough to expose it. He then produces a gun and goes out to cause trouble by shooting two members of one of the other gangs and breaks the long-running truce between the gangs. So this is where the film becomes increasingly incoherent. Firstly, we have a scene between Miguel and the leader of another gang as he presumably tries to smooth things over. However, the background noise is so loud that once again the entire scene is rendered incomprehensible. Before the games, Holmes. And I want proof. And then in a completely bizarre scene, Miguel berates Hector for his rash actions. He then pulls the gun Hector is holding against his head and tells him to pull the trigger, resulting in the most priceless reaction. What the foppers do to you? No! Well, okay, second most priceless reaction. Eddie then arrives on the scene and quite rightly wants to know why things have only gotten worse since he approached Aurelio to help him out. Hello, what the hell happened? You asked me to trust you. All of a sudden I've got two dead boppers and two dead lobos on my hands. In the middle of a truce. And Forensic is telling me these two shot each other. Now what the fuck is going on? I don't know. It sounds like these two shot each other. So it appears that this scene is in the movie for two reasons. Number one, to remind people that Eddie is still in the film, and number two, to keep padding this damn thing out. Then we come to kind of a weird scene. First up, Cesare appears and teleports around a bit. Then one of the rival gang leaders taunts a radio, and then they all just sort of leave. 
So you're the number one lobo, eh? What's your name? Hey, Cornejo. To the O, aren't you? We'll see. At the game. Fortunately, we're now nearing the end as the remaining Lobos gather to discuss what to do about the approaching games. At first, everyone wants to nominate Paolo, but Paolo has this to say. I nominate... Rello. Look, the rules say that anyone could be Prez by fighting for the Prez. Miguel is dead, man. Muerto, ese. I'm just summing things up in case you all forgot. Hector? Hector is dead too. Morello is alive, man. A veterano, he's never been jumped out. Aurelio wants to fight, but he refuses to kill and says that the gang must also stop killing. Los Lobos have to kill to survive. We don't have to kill. Killing is a fucking waste. Fight if you must. But mano a mano. This is the way the Lobos are going to do it from now on. Mano and Mano, if we do it that way, we're all going to be dead in six months. Or less if you fight more than once a month. The Lobo's got a reputation, Ese. We got to be strong. Otherwise, the other barrios think we're chavalas. Why don't we make the other gangs want to be like us? And how do you want to do that? The games. Oh, okay. I guess that is self-explanatory then. Rodriguez, I thought you were going to gather evidence on this Cesare so that we might just maybe shut these goddamn games of his down for good. But so far, all I've seen is a lot of nothing, ending with a couple of dead lobos who allegedly shot each other. Now what in the hell is going on? You know, I think he pretty much summed up my thoughts on this film so far. A bunch of shit came down. Things got screwed up. Yeah, I mean, this film was supposed to be about gang warfare and gladiatorial games, so, you know, what the hell happened to any of that? What in the hell am I supposed to tell the mayor's office? Tell him the truth. I'm working on it. Captain, my source is solid. I need more time. No, see, time is what we don't have any of. I'll say there's only 20 minutes left of this damn movie. Because if we don't find those games this year, we may all be looking for a job. Do you understand me? Yes. Good. Anyway, that seems to be enough for Eddie's boss, or at least it stops him short of having a coronary. Anyway, next scene, and Paolo and Aurelio are sitting around when Paolo brings up an awkward thought, given the circumstances. I was just kind of wondering what my father was like. Did you wonder through? Oh, he was a damn coward. He spent the whole time crawling around on the floor, begging me not to stab him anymore. Cesare tried to shoot me. And Loretta took the bullet meant for me. So I guess it was just fortunate that Cesare didn't bring a second bullet then. So, you lost a father, and I lost my wife. Gangs are a lot like wars. They're really good for nothing except for getting people killed. But maybe, just maybe we could change that at the games. Beautiful, now hold that shot for an unnaturally long time. Then we get some awkward posing from Paolo, as well as another MOON cameo! Then we finally get to the games we were promised from the beginning, as extras flood into the arena. Warriors! have gathered the games. And how do you fight? Hmm. It's almost as if you're heavy-handedly setting up for the Lobos to refuse to kill. The Lobos do not answer. Are they afraid? The Lobos are chicken shit! I'll pretend to swim towards any man who says that to me. And I say it's Cesare who is El Pollo. The fucking chicken shit. Why else would he have his army fight to the dead? Why? Because he is afraid you will one day unite and destroy him! I don't get it. Why wouldn't Cesare just kill him already? So anyway, Cesare bows to peer pressure and allows the games to be fought to first blood. 
So after so much of the finale being taken up by boring discussions about how the games should be fought and similar, it's good to finally get the games underway. Except the fights are often broke up by extremely disorienting camera work and many of the crowd members look bored. So naturally the fights are skimmed over and you are left under no illusion as to which fighters will progress and it's not surprising that the fights are so weak and rushed when so much of the film has been padding. Additionally, some of the fight scenes are sped up for seemingly no reason, making the fights even less appealing than they already are. Meanwhile, Cesare watches on, and it raises another question as to why he has these games made look so bored throughout. Even when watching the bopper doing the people's elbow. And there are about four of these fights and things are going well until Paolo is taken down by the bopper lead guy. Get up, Paolo! Get up, you bomb! Anyway, will Paolo get up? Well, yes, in about two seconds, once again creating no tension whatsoever. I would say that this scene was completely by the numbers, but even a film that had no imagination whatsoever wouldn't be this unbelievably dull. And it probably wouldn't include this bit. Oh my god, I am so sure that Paolo is going to kill this guy. The tension is just riveting. God, Paolo did not kill that guy. I am in total shock right now. So with the bopper leader praising Paolo's fighting skills and the crowd mostly going wild, with Cesare looking about as bored as you imagine someone watching this dross would be, it seems that Paolo has won and saved any gang member from dying or whatever. So in a not at all surprised twist, Cesare decides to fight Aurelio in combat. The two fight in the age old movie tradition of throwing punches that go nowhere near each other and the fight scene has no real emotional investment as it is once again badly shot, too short and feels tacked on. So with Cesare defeated by Aurelio, Cesare has his lackey hand him a gun. However, before he can kill Aurelio, Eddie arrives and kills him. The games are over! You can all go back to fighting your petty little turf wars. Killing each other for a few blocks of decayed city. You'll be doing exactly what we want you to do. Really? How do gunfights and murder play right into the police's hands? Anyway, whatever, Eddie pushes the guns a bad message, because we couldn't figure that out on our own. Then Paolo's mum enters the ring, and the whole thing ends with a so cheesy, it's actually kind of awesome rock song. In a fight, one lord and more yards, death in their eyes, no past and no future, just live and die. So that was East LA Warriors, and was it good? No. Was it awful? Eh, not especially. It's certainly got a message behind it, even if the message is obvious and poorly handled. It also was never really offensive, so the film is pretty harmless. However, it's definitely not a good film, even ironically. There are a few fun moments of goofiness in this film, but for a film about gladiatorial combat and gang violence, the film really lacks much of either. The story is badly told, and you can tell at times that the film is dragging its heels to hit the hour and a half mark. The film also struggles with having a budget much, much lower than is necessary to work, as is obvious throughout. The low budget is especially bad for the set design, as many of the sets look cheap and fake, and thanks to their loud graffiti and similar come across as distracting. The acting is poor and the sound design is so terrible that entire scenes are muffled to the point of incomprehension. Overall, I would say that East LA Warriors was kind of poor. I wouldn't recommend going out of your way to see it, especially if you like piñatas. Anyway, this has been Movie Vault 666, and I'm Chris, and I hope to see you next time.